Tonight it's Revelation Lesson 21. We are the seventh seal, part two, and we're going to talk about the first six trumpets. Turn with me to Revelation chapter 8, and uh, we will start reading at about verse 6 here tonight. In verse 6 it reads this way, And the seven angels, which had the seven trumpets, prepared themselves to sound. And the first angel sounded, and there followed hail and fire mingled with blood, and they were cast upon the earth. And the third part of trees was burnt up, and all green grass was burnt up. And the second angel sounded, and as it were a great mountain burning with fire was cast into the sea. And the third part of the sea became blood. And the third part of the creatures which were in the sea and had life died. And the third part of the ships were destroyed. And the third angel sounded, and there fell a great star from heaven, burning as it were a lamp. And it fell upon the third part of the rivers, and upon the fountain of waters. And the name of the star is called Wormwood. And the third part of the waters became Wormwood. And many men died of the waters, because they were made bitter. And the fourth angel sounded, and the third part of the sun was smitten, and the third part of the moon and the third part of the stars. So as the third part of them was darkened, and the day shone not for a third part of it, and the night likewise. And I beheld, and heard an angel flying through the midst of heaven, saying with a loud voice, Woe, woe, woe to the inhabitants of the earth, by reason of the other voices of the trumpet of the three angels, which are yet to sound. Praise the Lord. Sounds ominous enough, doesn't it? And uh, in fact, it it is, as you will discover in our studies as we progress. So let's take it up right there, verse 6 together. And we'd like to analyze what the scripture is teaching us. As you saw with me in our previous lesson on the seals, we saw that the damage that was coming on the earth was largely Almost by permission, God allowed man to really inflict the herd, as it were, except for this major, major earthquake that took place towards the end of the seals, which was worldwide. The trumpet judgments vary from the seals in that there is no question there is something quite supernatural happening. God now has taken a hand. And so we find the the very first verse starts with the concept that the seven angels which had the seven trumpets, prepared themselves to sound. It's, it's as if they were handed the task and the angels holding the trumpets kind of filled their lungs, as it were, in readiness to blow the trumpet which was assigned uh, to them. Now, the first four trumpets, which, uh, Lord willing, we will cover tonight, seem to happen by description in the, script, in the scriptures. They seem to take place fairly swiftly, one after the other. Uh, there's very little detail given, and yet what is given is is amazing when you start to consider it uh, carefully. But they, they seem to take place in quick succession, and each of them brings about a disaster which specifically affects a third of the things of the earth. The things that they affect are, are affected by a third. Now, the last three trumpets, which are also called the three woes, and you notice the angel at the end there cried out, woe, 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 because of the three trumpets that are yet to sound. They're also known as the three woes. Well, these seem to represent even more or yet more severe judgments that are going to take place and the disasters that will take place. And so there's a more severe degree of judgment which is going to be called out by those last three trumpets. Interestingly included in those uh, last trumpets is the unleashing of demonic forces upon earth. So it's going to be quite an attack. It's going to be quite a devastation, not just from a physical uh, sense with supernatural intervention, uh, but also from a, in a spiritual sense. Uh, what we will study tonight is, and you will see, that God has taken a hand in these disasters and that it leaves no doubt in the minds of humanity uh, that this is God speaking, as it were, to humanity for the last time. Just so you remember, re- repentance is still possible during this time of great tribulation until the end, until the seventh trumpet. If you recall, we've studied that the seventh trumpet will summon the church to heaven and will also bring in the wrath of God. Now, what is interesting, and I'll show you a chart on this as we go on, 
is that whereas these judgments seem to, to affect a third of whatever they, they are sent against, when it comes to the woes, there is no third. It's 100%. It affects everything. These um, uh, judgments that come with the trumpets are certainly reminiscent of the plagues which God uh, brought upon Egypt when Pharaoh refused to let the people go. And for the church, this is soon to come to an end. So the timing of this, the chronology of this for the church, this is where if we are here uh, personally, the church that is here in any case, we'll be certainly awaiting with bated breath for the last trumpet to soon sound. The dead in Christ will rise first. And then, of course, those that remain will be caught up to meet the Lord in the air, to be forever with Jesus. And we certainly look forward to that time. We are reassured by the text that Jesus said these days, and this is the days it's referring to, these days, the days of these events will be cut short, will be shortened for the sake of the elect. Now, we don't know exactly the time period that each of these trumpets take. We're not told exactly, so we would be guessing and we don't want to do that. But it, the way they're presented, they certainly appear to be coming in fairly quick succession. So whatever time period they last, they certainly will be happening fairly fast one after the other. All right, that said, let's have a look at the trumpets as each of the angels begins to sound. So the first angel sounded and they followed hail and fire mingled with blood and they were cast upon the earth and the third part of the trees were burnt up and all green grass was burnt up. Say a third tonight. A third. That's an important uh, concept. I need you to remember it. In these verses, you will find 11 times the third is mentioned. And it is, to me, an, an interesting concept, and we will see why it is important as we move on to study. What we need to consider, first up, is that what is poured upon the earth is hail, fire, mingled with blood. It seems a, an unusual uh, type of precipitation, clearly. Now, hail we've seen, uh, and we've seen fire in, in the heavens in the sense of perhaps lightning and so forth. But there is another reference in the scriptures, back in Exodus, of course, where God actually rained hail with fire that ran along the ground. Now, we can only imagine that this was a special type of uh, lightning or certainly some kind of fire from heaven in that sense that clearly mingled with the hell just to simply cause devastation amongst the Egyptians. And once again, uh, it's not something we, we have seen readily or that you see readily in an average storm. So even back then, it was very much the hand of God speaking to the Egyptians about judgment and about the fact that they had refused to obey the directive of God. Now, this event in Exodus about the Egyptians is repeated or at least referenced uh, in the Old Testament a number of times, uh, in Joshua, in Job, in Psalms several times, and other parts. And it always denotes, it's always to do with the judgment of God. So there's no question about the fact that what we are seeing here is not a natural event. Okay, It's not every time you see hail and it's got fire and blood mingled in with it. Now, let's study it together and have a look at the details of this. First of all, what we are seeing is a third. This is a very specific result, isn't it? And it seems to me that when God is bringing about the judgment, when God has anything to do with the havoc, the disaster, certainly with what he brings about, he's very, very much in control. And to me, something that is worth noting is the surgical-like precision of the judgment, a third. No more and no less. And God actually affects a third of the trees and all the green grass. Now, some, of course, have imagined that this judgment affects the world in a particular area. So it's a localized plague because they think, well, a third of the trees, you know, so the rest is fine. But I don't think that that would glorify God in context. That would not necessarily show the hand of God per se. I don't think that a third of the world's trees could ever be found in one place anyway. Okay. Uh, in fact, I don't know if you have an idea how much of the Earth's surface is covered by forests. Any, any, any clue? Has anybody ever considered it? It's about a third, 31% of the Earth's surface. Now, we're talking forests now. This is actually forested areas. That doesn't mean every other tree, like trees we've got around in the suburbs and so forth, but just actual forested area covers about 31% of the Earth, which is Interesting when you consider that that means about 4 billion, now say it with me, 4 billion hectares of space. 
that's a lot, a lot of room. Okay, so the forests uh, of the earth cover an awful lot of space on the earth. And when we begin to understand the nature and the size of the disaster we are talking about, we're talking about a third of four billion hectares. Now, if you do the maths, and uh, it's not difficult uh, to do, let me write it down for you, because they're interesting figures. It comes down to 1,333,333,333. Is that interesting? Okay. So, what is interesting to me is that the Earth at present... We are destroying or using up or utilizing, whichever way you may want to see it, approximately five and a half million hectares of forestry every year. So every year, that's what's happening. Naturally, a lot is regrowing and so forth. That's a lot slower a usage uh, rate than it used to be. Uh, But when this happens, when this strikes, you're talking about a global disaster that is noteworthy. This is just not a localized fire. This is not something that just takes out a few hundred acres or a few thousand acres of forest. This is a billion and a third hectares. Now, a hectare, by the way, is about two and a half acres. Just to give you an idea, Australia, the whole land of Australia, if it was a, a forest, the whole land of Australia, that would represent about 795 million hectares. So you're talking about an area about twice the size of Australia, all made of trees, all those trees are destroyed. That's what we're talking about. This is a, an awesome event. In fact, this is no small cataclysm. And I think that if one could begin to imagine it, it, uh, it would shock us to see and understand exactly how much of the Earth's uh, forestry is going to be destroyed. And this is why the Earth, man's ability to control this is going to be absolutely annulled. There's no way in the world. Nobody is going to be able to claim that this is a natural disaster. Now, different people have understood the third in different ways. People have thought that somehow... Pockets of trees and forests everywhere will be destroyed somehow so that it all adds up to a third. That's one way to look at it. Others have postulated that every third tree is destroyed. Whichever way, it's going to be a bushfire of a different nature. Now, you know, you've seen a bushfire, right? What happens in a bushfire? It just burns through a particular area and it it usually stops in a certain regional localized area. That's how it works. But not this. This is a global disaster and it consumes a third of the trees of the world. So, a major cataclysm, and it has incredible repercussions, and let me help you think through a little bit of this. What would happen if you lose that much forestry, and quite suddenly? What what effects would there be on Earth? What sort of repercussions would there be, do you think? Just Jeanette. Uh, Well, uh, it would be very hard to breathe. (laughs) <laughs> yes. Okay. Wipe out a lot of the um, wildlife. Yes. Okay. Right. Well. Okay. So if we think about it for a moment, if a third of the forestry or the forests of the world are destroyed, and that's a massive, massive number. First of all, a third of oxygen production on Earth is going to be removed. It's going to be hard to breathe deep, huh? Also, think about it. With all that much timber burning. An awful lot of smoke and fire. I don't know if you've noticed it recently with the fire we've had locally. I mean, it's only probably, what, 30, 40 kilometers out. And it's a small fire by comparison to what we're talking about. And yet you can smell it and breathe it. The wind carries. Can you imagine when this is happening all over the world? It's going to be quite an amazing event. They were saying, brother, that smoke from uh, Port Stevens and Delhi because Sydney. Sydney, yeah, okay. So, okay, think about it. If such a localized fire can affect 150 kilometers or so down the road, imagine when a third of the world's trees are on fire and burning. And the thing is that emergency services, uh, fire brigades and so forth, will be powerless in the face of such a widespread disaster and stunned at the destruction. I think that this is what we can expect the effects, of course, on, on economies worldwide is going to be unbelievable. Paper production, building materials, food and other industries will all be affected. This is no small cataclysm. 
And when you think that a third of the oxygen will be going missing overnight, and on top of that, massive, massive amounts of smoke and burning material will go into the atmosphere, you can appreciate it's going to be obviously very traumatic. The world will observe this. And why is God doing this? Now, people say, wow, that's mean, a third of the trees. Imagine all those beautiful trees burning. But I want you to see the grace of God in this. And as we study tonight, please observe the grace of God. God could have destroyed two-thirds, but he destroys a third. It's like, yet again, for the last time, God is warning humanity. See, this is not a natural event. This is God taking a hand, very much an act of God in this case. People, as, as we've discussed, will have always blamed God for, for acts that are uh, natural through the environment, often brought about by our own doing. But in this case, it will be obvious when every third tree burns or so much is happening that will very clearly God is in control. Uh, also, what is interesting is that the green grass is burnt and not a third this time, but all of the green grass. Now, all of us appreciate a nice green pasture, and we see an awful lot of that in our country. It's beautiful. But you've also traveled through parts of the country in times of drought, and you've seen large areas that are just browned, in fact, burnt out, as it were, because there's simply no water. Well, that is going to be more of the look of the place uh, during this time. Now, once again, you can imagine the effects of this. Once again, the wildlife as well as fodder and so forth for animals that we uh, depend on for survival. So you can see that the tightening here, the pressure is coming upon the world. Uh, judgment is being poured out. And people will, will have to start to think again, if they don't do it already, what's happening in this world? And where is, it, where is this world coming to? And that's the whole idea. It's God yet again calling, knocking on the door of the heart, saying, repent, because the time is at hand. Sparing the two-thirds, remember, and destroying only a third is specific and precise, and it is very much uh, reminiscent of the way that God poured uh, judgment on Egypt while sparing the land of Goshen. Now, I want you to see this also. Uh, it actually speaks about hail, fire, and blood. What do you think the blood part of it is? We can understand hail. We've all seen that. And that, by the way, in itself, we bring quite a lot of destruction. And we understand the fire, and clearly it's severe fire because it burns an awful lot of, uh, of trees. So this is not just a little spark here and there. This is severe fire. But then on top of that, it's blood. So how are we to understand this? Well, perhaps the mingled with blood part can be readily understood with storms that are mixed with lightning, a sheet, lightning that runs across the earth. And the mixture of blood mentioned in the scripture should probably be taken in the same context that the Bible speaks about the moon shall turn to blood. In other words, we're referring to the color. But in this case... It's something that's precipitating. It's not just something we're looking at. When you're t talking about the moon turning the blood, you're talking a blood red color in the moon. And to some degree, that is not an unusual thing. We have seen it. It's going to happen again. And as we've discussed before, it's largely to do with the ash and, and contents from volcanic eruption and so forth, which will take place all, often at what accompanies major earthquakes and so forth. And uh, we have seen that, it can be seen. But what about this precipitation that comes down with the fire, with the hail, and it's, uh, it's blood-like, or at least the color of blood, and quite clearly appears to be like blood. Well, it has been observed before, although in a small scale. So let me read you, this is actually from history. A man by the name of Bollinger actually wrote uh, a book, The Apocalypse, and it was in the 1900s, early 1900s, so it was at the very beginning of the 20th century. And he wrote about the phenomenon of blood raining from the sky has been observed in limited areas and on a small scale. On one of these occasions, he says, according to Pliny, was during the con consulship of Manius Acilius and Gaius Portius, Babylonians, to recorded red dust and rain falling from the sky. Instances of bloody rain have been recorded in diverse countries. What happens is the red dust, which is soluble in water, falling from the sky in water drops, doesn't originate in the clouds, but actually comes, once again, from volcanic eruptions and from cosmic spaces. And this type of dust is something that actually falls down with the rain, with the hail, and often colors it to a blood red color. This dust is often found on snow in the mountains in polar regions. So it's not unusual to see areas where, which are actually reddened with this dust. 
in another reference, Cicero, you're talking now back in Roman days, of course, tells us that uh, word was brought to the Roman Senate on one occasion that it had rained blood and the river Atratus had flowed with blood. Similarly, as we have seen, this powder, this dust, well, there's been so much of it that it's literally coloured the waters of rivers. On another uh, reference, on August 17, 1819, Dr. Sace uh, tells us that Captain Ross saw the mountains of Baffins Bay covered for eight miles with blood-red snow many feet in depth. Also that Saucer found it on Mount San Bernard in 1778 and another man, Ramon, found it in the Pyrenees and Summerfield in Norway. So it's not an unusual, altogether unknown uh, phenomenon that both precipitation being rain as well as snow has been coloured red. And when we are talking blood, we're not talking the actual stuff that courses through our veins. We are talking the color of and very much the nature or the feel of it because of how it comes from the sky. It originates on earth, of course, but it comes back down as a precipitation. Interestingly, the ancients considered it an ominous sign, of course, when it happened and a prelude to much death. And sadly, uh, that is very much the case yet again. Uh, this uh, precipitation that accompanies the hail and fire is termed as blood, and this has apparently been observed, as we have seen in times before. Now, what is interesting, before I move on to the next trumpet, is that you notice that a third is destroyed, two-thirds are spared. And as we said, this is reminiscent of the judgments uh, that uh, God poured upon Egypt. Uh, what I want to state about this is the fact that when God poured the judgments on Egypt, if you remember, it affected the land of Egypt, but it actually did not affect the land of Goshen. Well, where was Goshen? In Egypt. In fact, it was smack in the middle of Egypt. That's where the Israelites were. So God was able to control the plagues. Now think of some of the plagues that God brought upon Egypt, and yet God was able to control the plagues in such a way that they affected everything around the Israelites, but not the Israelites. Now, the reason I mention this is that if you'll turn with me to Revelation 3.10, there is a verse of scripture which we have studied, of course, and it's God making a promise to the church at Philadelphia. And he said, because you have kept the word of my patience, I will also keep thee from the hour of temptation, which shall come upon all the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. Now, pre-tribulationists actually use this verse and apply it to all Christians right across the board, stating that because of this verse, therefore the church will not go through the tribulation because they're being kept from the hour that's to try the world. Well, I want you to notice that, first of all, God spoke it specifically to Philadelphia, and he said, because you have kept the word of my patience, so there was a, a quality or a condition, if you please, a qualifier, Okay, you have kept the word of my patience, I will also keep you from the hour of temptation. Now, where we differ is that they read that to mean from, meaning God takes the church out of the world so that they don't suffer the trials and difficulties that are going to come. But as we've seen, God poured out judgment, ten plagues actually, on the people of Egypt, and yet was able to keep the people of Israel, who which were in the middle of Egypt, free from those plagues. Did God keep them from the plagues of Egypt? Yeah, but they were right there and present. In other words, what we are seeing in Scripture is that it's not essential for God to remove His people out of this world to keep them from the judgments. You see, we're not talking about a natural disaster. We're talking about God-ordained judgment. And as you can see, if God can kill off every third tree which will be astounding to the authorities. How can that possibly happen? Bushfires don't behave that way, right? Then God is able, with surgical precision, to affect a group of people and actually preserve others. And so it's a terminology which has caused a great deal of debate. But here is another thought for you, if you'd like to think about it with me for a moment. Uh, let's assume that I am standing here under the rain with an umbrella. And Peter is standing in the rain, and I say to him, come out from the rain. And he can come under my umbrella right here, right? Now, notice what's happening here. He's actually coming out from the rain. He's being kept from the rain. He's coming out, and he's under an umbrella. But he's not out of this world. 
He hasn't gone to another country where it's not rainy. He hasn't had to physically be removed from the location to avoid the plague. God has protected him, you see, with that umbrella. And I believe this is what God is going to do with the church. God is going to keep the church. However, we do understand from Scripture, and this is why we believe that the church will not go through the wrath of God, which will follow after the seventh trumpet, because it says the church has not been appointed unto wrath. There's a different story altogether. In other words, he'll take us out of this place before he pours out the wrath. That's because there is no further repentance available at that time. So I wanted to cover that quickly because you will have some people telling you that to be kept from is to be removed altogether, but not necessarily so. In fact, God uh, did not necessitate removing the people of Israel out of Egypt to bring about the plagues. You see, God is in control of these judgments. Amen? And uh, so you can see that, again, he's able to keep us. And throughout the scriptures, we find that that's the terminology of the scripture. He's able to keep us. He's able to preserve us. And there is this preserving of his people, which is by far more miraculous than the removing of them. In fact, I think that this will be a very necessary time for the church to be present, because there will be some people repenting. Some people who will actually want to see, and they can see, the hand of God here. They don't have to say anymore what's happening. They can see what's happening. God is judging. And I believe there will be people, you and I, those that are of the church, the true church of the living God, able to direct some and bring them to a place of repentance. Praise the Lord. All right. So right until the end, we need to be doing uh, the work of the Lord. The burning of all the green grass will obviously change the color and the view of many parts of the earth. And uh, you can see, though, that, again, this is not a mere natural disaster because you may see the grass being burnt in Australia because of extreme heat, but in other parts of the world it would be perfectly green. But what if all the green grass everywhere at the same time burns up? Something tells me this is not a natural event. Amen? God has taken hand. Okay, so that's the first trumpet. All right, now we'll be moving fairly quickly because we've set the scene and you'll see that there is some form of repetition throughout in terms of the third and so forth. But I wanted to make certainly understood that when we are speaking about being kept from, that God is able to keep us in spite of the judgment to come and that he is actually able to protect. And I believe there's evidence in scripture that he has done that many times and he will do it again. God takes a hand and makes it happen in a, in a manner that is stunning to the world because this is not a localized event. Now you can have, as you can see from the records that are found in history, uh, the event happening here or, or there, but this is worldwide. And, uh, and so all of a sudden you can appreciate uh, this is not something that you can class as a natural event. Okay, well, let's have a look at the second trumpet then. As uh, the angel begins to sound the second trumpet, it says, and the second angel sounded, and as it were, a great mountain burning with fire was cast into the sea, and the third part of the sea became blood. There it is again. And the third part of the creatures which were in the sea and had life died, and the third part of the ships were destroyed. Again, I want you to notice the incredible precision of these destructions and the reason that I believe God chose to do it this way is once again to explain, to verify to send a very, very loud message to the world that this is no natural event, this is not a natural disaster see, we are to some degree become accustomed, now we still reel back at the images of an earthquake in, in Italy or a tornado in some parts of the world and a flood here or a fire there and, and we still think, oh, you know, those poor people and, and of course there is relief going from one country uh, to the other and, and, and help and, and so forth but what happens when this is global? What happens when a third, meaning all over the world, uh, there's such devastation? And as we pointed out with the trees, that is an awful lot of forest burning everywhere. There is no way that our services here can go and help anywhere else. They won't be able to have help right here locally. And so you can appreciate when these things are taking place, God is saying loud and clear, sending a very, very loud message uh, that uh, this is judgment. And the message is this, repent. While there's yet time, repent. Sadly, very few will, but those that will have an opportunity. Okay, so what is interesting about this one, again, is that when this trumpet sounds, something humongous happens. It says it's like a great mountain burning with fire. 
Now, most commentators, again, try to spiritualize these verses that we've read and try not to take a literal approach of interpretation here. But there is really no indication in the context that it shouldn't be taken as literal. That's what it says. It's like a great mountain. Now, I'm not sure what you would imagine, but something like a meteorite, an asteroid, so large that it doesn't get consumed as it travels through Earth's atmosphere, of course, and lands into the sea. Now, what is interesting about uh, such a large piece of rock, and this is what this would be, a great mountain, is that when something this size usually hits the Earth, it creates just amazing, massive disasters, and the, the whole Earth would reel with it. But what is interesting is, once again, this is where I want you to see the hand of God and the control that God has, that somehow God limits its damage to a third. Okay? It's very hard for us to reason how this can possibly be. And it gets even more amazing as you read on in the next uh, couple of uh, judgments, because uh, something similar happens, and again, a third of the waters of the rivers is affected. So this is quite an amazing thing. But what you notice is, This uh, is a huge asteroid that hits the earth, but instead of somehow tilting the earth or causing trouble everywhere, only a third is affected. I see the hand of God controlling nature once again and bringing about the specific effect that he is intending. Of course, this is unusual, and uh, again, it should cause man, humanity to sit up and take notice. The meteorite um, burns with fire, which is in keeping with the nature, of course, of these heavenly bodies as they enter the atmosphere. But the immense heat and the impact that it brings shows anything but what could be expected under natural circumstances. God is controlling it, and you see, the again, the very surgical-like precision of God bringing judgment only on a third of the waters. Now, again, are we to think of this as a localized damage? Is there anywhere in the world where a third of the oceans exist? I'd like to think that, once again, God is speaking to the whole world. And so the effects of this asteroid falling will be noticed all over the world by a third. I don't think that any real explanation could be given as to how a third of all the sea creatures could be in the one spot. That's why I think it's going to be something that happens globally. And again, by God's hand and directive, somehow a third of the creatures all over the world perish. Uh, Now, let's think about this for a minute. Because when you're talking about a third of all the sea creatures, you're talking about a lot of dead fish. Now, I can't even begin to estimate it. We could estimate to some degree the forestry, and that's, that's a big number. Right, But how do you estimate a third of the sea creatures? Now, what happens to fish and sea things when they die? Hmm? They float, and they float on shore. And when you're talking about millions of tons of dead sea things, I can only begin to just touch the imagination of the kind of stench and the kind of things that will happen all over the world. It's just, it's going to be impossible. Certainly, they'll have to agree that this is no natural event. Again, this is why I believe we are talking about a catastrophe that cannot be explained by scientific uh, reasoning or by some logical means, and it is not localized because it's affecting a third of the sea creatures all over the world. There is no way that there is a situation where a third of the sea creatures are all in one in one locality. It's simply not the case. So somehow, God so so controls this situation that when it happens, a third of the sea water turns uh, to blood, and a third of the creatures that are in the sea that had life die. And that's a lot of creatures. And beyond that is that not just the sea creatures, but also a third of all the ships of the world. Now again, you can't tell me that in any one time, a third of all the ships are going to be in one specific place. And see, this is once again, God touching, as it were, in his own manner, and showing, whether it's every third ship that sinks, or what have you, we don't know exactly, but we know this, a third of the ships of the world. Now there are a lot of ships I see every single day. We don't realize, because we don't necessarily live in that realm, But every day, literally thousands and thousands of vessels carry goods across the waters 
from one country to the other, all kinds of things, coal and building materials and products and you name it, livestock and so forth. And so at any one time, you've got literally thousands of ships that are at sea. And uh, the Bible says that a third of these will be sunk, will be destroyed. So every country will suffer at this. There will be a global catastrophe once again. And it will bring wonder to all humanity because they will have to acknowledge that this is an act of God. By the way, let me explain that terminology, an act of God, in case you haven't ever considered it. It is an actual legal terminology, in case you're wondering. In insurance, an act of God is described as an event that is directly or exclusively a result from the occurrence of natural causes that could not have been prevented by the exercise of foresight and uh, therefore caution. In other words, it's something inevitable. Courts have actually recognized various events as the, an act of God, such as tornadoes and earthquakes, deaths, extraordinarily, say, high tides, violent winds and floods. Many insurance policies do not cover you for acts of God. In fact, they actually exclude in their, in their policy documents anything that is considered an act of God. And, of course, one of the problems there is that it then goes to court all too often to determine, was this really an act of God? But what they say is an act of God is yet nevertheless a natural event. It's usually a localized flood or a localized fire or so forth. And so it's not something that we would class as an act of God. But this, now this is very much the hand of God. Okay? So I think that certainly no insurance claim can be made on this stuff. So you can imagine the impact on the environment when so many dead things float to the surface uh, and wash uh, ashore, uh, the smell driving people insane, the pollution on the earth, the stench, possible disease, uh, the shipping companies that will lose so many millions and millions of dollars in their fleets and incomes. And as a result, of course, the price of goods that will increase and escalate because of it. And of course, other financial distresses. The blood color of the water, once again, reminds humanity that uh, these are ominous events. They're witnessing both the judgment and the grace and mercy of God. The judgment because a third is destroyed and the grace and mercy of God because two-thirds are not. So, you know, for people to say, oh, look at this, if God was a God of love, why would he do this? Well, let's think that God is a God of love because he's sparing two-thirds. At this point, he's still giving humanity a chance to repent. Can you believe our loving Father is so beautiful, amen, and so faithful that right to the very, very end, even when he has done all that he has already and humanity has utterly rejected God, he still knocks on the doors of the hearts to cause repentance right into these times. Now remember that as we come into those times of vials of the wrath of God, the acts of God there wipe out 100%. So there is an increasing severity in the judgment of God as the wrath is poured out. You all with me so far? Mm -hmm. Let's move to the third trumpet then and let's see what happens there. Okay, and the third angel sounded and there fell a great star from heaven burning as it were a lamp. This was a bright one. And it fell upon the third part of the rivers and upon the fountains of water. Now I said to you earlier that this was going to be even more unusual. The name of the star is called Wormwood, and a third part of the waters became Wormwood, and many men died of the waters because they were made bitter. A great burning star. Now, we could say this is another meteor, but actually, a meteor, which is also incorrectly, by the way, called a falling star, a meteor is not actually a star. A meteor is essentially a chunk of rock that burns as, as they're drawn into the atmosphere. By the way, does anybody know what the difference is between, say, a meteor and a comet? The main difference, actually, is what they're made from. A meteor is rock, and it becomes a meteorite as it actually is drawn into the atmosphere and begins to burn. Usually it becomes virtually nothing, unless they're very, very huge. They're also known as asteroids. They're very, very large. But a a comet, in fact, is uh, rock, but also ice. And that's really the difference. And so they burn up very quickly, very brightly. That's why they shine so bright. But they're not stars. The difference is that stars are not made of rock. They're actually bodies of burning gas, which light up the sky. What is described here is a large star, and clearly a very, very bright one. And uh, what is, again, unusual about the star falling, if you read carefully, it actually says that this star falls and affects a third of what? The rivers and the waters. Think with me for a minute. Something falling out of space 
we would imagine it as a localized event, right? But once again, this is how it's, it's got to be seen, is that God affects literally a third of the waters. And this is drinking water, sweet water now, what we might call potable water, river water and fountains of water all over the earth. So this cannot be deemed a natural event of any kind. When a star of this nature falls and affects a third of the water all over the earth, this speaks volumes to humanity and reminds you that there's a very brief time to repent and turn to God. And the Almighty here, once again, is clearly giving a message. He's saying, make it right. Is the instigator of this phenomenon, and he leaves no doubt this is not an event you can explain by natural causes. You cannot say this is a natural thing. What is also interesting about this information, if we analyze it a little bit, apart from the sort of judgment that it brings, is that the star has a name. What's the name? Wormwood. Wormwood. Okay. Now, of course, this uh, shouldn't surprise us that the star has a name. If you read in Psalm 147 and verse 4, it says that God tells the number of the stars and he calls them all by their names. So God has names for every single star. Now, I'm told if they are accurate, that there are literally millions and billions of stars out there. And uh, if, if that be the case, God has a name for every single one of them. This one is called Wormwood. Now, if you're not familiar with the terminology, Wormwood is actually a well-known herb. It is extremely bitter. It has some medicinal properties. But this is a little bit different again, because the, the third of the waters that it affects all turn to wormwood, notice that many died because of the water because they were made bitter. So this is not just a taste of bitterness. There's something terribly poisonous about the bitterness that it kills people. So this bitterness was more than just a taste. It was potentially a contamination, a poison, something that God allowed to fall on these waters and that took the lives of many who drank it. Now, you know we cannot survive uh, without water for long. And when a third of the drinkable water of the earth is made undrinkable, uh, what is the natural effect on earth? There's a lot of thirst. Did you know, for instance, that the World Health Organization has determined that a very large percentage of the earth's water already is not actually fit for human consumption? We are very blessed to live in a country where we can actually turn a tap on and drink the water straight out. And even then we have to wander because of all the stuff they put in it, right? That's why we put uh, filters and all kinds of things on our taps to try and make the water a little bit better. But there are many countries where you cannot do that. You can't just turn a tap on and drink it. And uh, much of the water is simply not drinkable. Well, when a third of the, shall we say, drinkable water is affected in this manner, which has not just an incredibly bitter taste, but the effects of potentially killing people, you can appreciate uh, how this is going to astound even the staunchest scientists and challenge their resources. And it should cause humanity to think yet again, how is this possible? How can such a, an event affect the whole world to a third in this manner? How is this possible except God has taken a hand? Well, there will be a very thirsty world and perhaps a reminder that their souls should be thirsting after God. If you notice carefully, in each of these judgments, it's like God is knocking at the door and reminding them. The blood reminds them. The trees remind them. All of creation, in other words, is reminding humanity God is in control and you need to make it right. Even this, the causing of thirst, it's like God is saying, Listen to your soul. You thirst for something greater. In any case, uh, many will suffer and many will uh, die as a result of it. Again, we need to remember that whilst the church may well suffer at the hand of Antichrist, uh, the Antichrist system by persecutions and attacks, the saints of God are going to be protected, miraculously kept from perils which are affecting the world. Remember, he will keep us from and if we are faithful to the Lord. Is this possible? Is it possible that if a third of the water here in Newcastle was to be affected, and you go to the tap and you drink it, you don't die, but a person that doesn't believe will die. Is that possible? Mm -hmm. Yeah, God can do it. In fact, let me read it to you from Scripture. If you will turn it up, it's found in Mark 16 and verse 18. It says, of those that believe, they shall take up serpents. And if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. Isn't that beautiful? So you can rest assured that God is able to keep us 
in spite of the fact that we may be here, he's able to keep us from these things. But listen, there is a condition. Remember, the church of Philadelphia kept his patience, kept his word, was faithful unto the Lord. Very, very important. So he will keep us if uh, we are faithful to him. So here it is a situation where God allows something that is so incredibly unusual to come to earth, destroy a third, affect a third, and even kill many individuals. And quite clearly, there will be individuals that will drink and not be affected and others that will drink and be uh, dead as a result. Okay, wormwood. Not just bitter, but bitterly dead. Very, very lethal. And the fourth angel sounded. Now, notice, please, how quickly the succession of these uh, judgments seem to take effect. Death follows this last one. And then when the fourth angel sounds, something again very amazing happens. The third part of the sun is smitten and the third part of the moon and uh, the third part of the stars. Now, at first reading, I thought third part of the sun not shining that's going to make the place extremely cold but if you read carefully what follows in that verse it actually says a little bit more it says so as the third part of them was darkened and the day shone not for a third part of it and the night likewise now that's interesting information so let me cover it with you uh, quickly if i can Obviously, again, we're talking a third. You can see the consistency of the judgment here. The fourth angel sounds and the the attention, the focus of this, turns from earth now to the lights in heaven. All of a sudden, that's being affected as well. Everything that is relating to earth. And again, we see that this cannot possibly be deemed a natural event. There is no way that there will be a scientific explanation for this. Let me explain to you what I believe is going to happen during this time. What you read here is different from what uh, may be taking place at other times that we've read. If you remember, we've studied once before. If you have a look quickly, Revelation 6 and 12, it says, And I beheld when he had opened the sixth seal, and lo, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair. Do you remember that scripture? And the moon became as blood. Now, if you recall, there's a couple of references to that event, but we believe that that was because of the earthquake and therefore the uh, potential volcanic eruptions and all the ash that goes up into the air. And, of course, that naturally darkens the sun and turns the moon a blood-like color. Now, that we have seen, and though this is going to be quite an event, what we are reading about here is actually quite different. Again, the terminology of this particular passage is different because notice what it says and the third part of the sun was what smitten it wasn't covered like like ash going over like sackcloth it was smitten you know that word in the greek literally means flattened it was like smacked down it was like turned off now notice that there is no mention of an earthquake in this particular portion or that any peculiar or specific other event could could affect the sun in a third even if we want to allow that these previous trumpets and the judgments could have affected the earth and there may be shakes and it's not mentioned here, but earthquakes and and such events, if there was ash in the atmosphere, it would affect the entire sun, wouldn't it? Just like we've read before and and would affect the the moon by turning it to a blood-like color. But that's not what we're reading here. We're talking about a third not functioning, both in the day and in the night. So in the instance of the sun being covered by ash, for a while the whole effect of the sun is diminished, but here we find that the third of the sun doesn't shine. I think that this is now uh, talking about not so much the intensity of the sun, but I think it's talking about the duration of its shining. I believe that if a third of the sun was to be turned off in the sense that we were not to have the heat of the sun. In other words, if the heat of the sun was turned off by a third, we would all freeze on earth and uh, there'd be nothing left. But that's not what we're looking at here. I don't think it's the intensity that we're talking about, but the ability to give us light. Now, isn't that interesting? What is God doing? He's calling people to repentance. And by turning the lights off, he's reminding them of the darkness that they're living in. Now, what it is interesting is that both through the day and through the night, God gave us a luminary, a light, to help us see. 
And from this point onwards, a third is going to be unable to shine. So in other words, both the sun and the moon are not shining for the regular time that they do. Now, if I get this right, our 24-hour day made up of 12 hours approximately of daylight and 12 hours of nightlight are going to actually turn out to be more like 16 hours of daylight and moonlight. So, you know, you wanted more hours in a day, uh, you've just got less. And, you know, what's interesting about this is that God doesn't mind turning the sun off because where we are going, we won't need the sun. In the new Jerusalem, in the new world that God is built, He is the light. There is no sun, there is no sunlight required. And so these are, are going to be some amazing times. Now, some have envisaged uh, basically what would amount to a daily sun eclipse and a nightly moon eclipse. And that could possibly uh, be the way that God flattens or removes a third of the sunlight, perhaps, so that for each day there is an eclipse and each night an eclipse. That may be an explanation. In any case, whatever you're looking at, you're looking at something amazing, unusual, and certainly not natural. And once again, humanity will have to say, this is an act of God. This is something way beyond natural. It is supernatural. So it seems to me that this falls in line with the description of Jesus in Matthew 24 and 19. In fact, I want you to turn there with me. We've referred to Matthew 24 several times, as you recall, because I believe that Jesus gives us a chronology of these events in Matthew 24. And again, the terminology used here is very similar to what we've just read in Revelation chapter 8. And to me, this is quite exciting because it confirms the timing of the last trumpet, of course. Have a look in Matthew uh, 24. We want to read at about verse uh, 29, I believe. All right, it says, Immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be, what? Darkened. That's very interesting. And the moon shall not give her light. It doesn't say it shall be shouted over or, or uh, like, you know, like a sackcloth or turned to blood. But both the sun and the moon will not give their light. And the stars shall fall from heaven and the powers of the heavens shall darken. And then notice after that, then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. And then shall the tribes of the earth mourn because he's coming with wrath. Okay. And they shall see the sun coming with the clouds of heaven and with power and great glory. Notice it says, and he shall send his angels with a what? A great sound of a trumpet. And they shall gather his elect from the four winds and from one end of heaven to the other. The tribulation of those days are the times that we are seeing taking place. It's referring to these difficult times. Now, I want to distinguish here, if I may, uh, the great tribulation is the whole period of the seven trumpets. But specifically, the tribulation or the great tribulation could be classed as these first four and the woes of the great tribulation, the last three. So it says immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened. And I think this is very clearly what we're reading about here in Revelation chapter 8. So it would appear that where we would have liked more daylight hours, we're actually going to have only 16 lit hours, eight or so in, in the day and uh, somewhat the same at night. And the darkness, remember, is a reminder, I believe, and a call of God to turn from the darkness of sin, to repent, and uh, people will not be able to explain this away. We know that God is uh, bringing judgment, and again, the nature of this darkness is leaving no doubt uh, that this is not, absolutely not a natural event, not scientifically explainable phenomenon, and there it is, the hand and intervention of God calling humanity to repentance. The sad reality, unfortunately, is as we read throughout the rest of the uh, Revelation, we will find that in spite of him sparing two-thirds and giving yet more time for people to repent and space during this time of great tribulation, that overall people will still turn against God. They will still worship the man of sin. They will blaspheme God and not uh, repent. I want to end, if you will bear with me, uh, let's go to the last verse of that chapter. Verse 13, it says, And I beheld and heard an angel flying through heaven, saying with a loud voice, Woe, woe, woe to the inhabitants of the earth by reason of the other voices of the trumpet uh, of the three angels which are yet to sound. 
So we thought the first four were pretty horrifying, amazing, supernatural, cataclysmic events that affect the whole earth, but only by a third what's going to happen in the next three. Well, the angel says it's going to be woe. Does anybody know what the word woe might mean? What does it mean when we say woe? Sorry? Watch out. Watch out, yeah. Yeah, okay. It means grievous trouble, distress, affliction. Amen. So these are three trumpets that are in a class of their own. And again, as we said earlier, it's like the severity of the tribulation judgments are being amped up during these last three uh, and don't forget that the very last one, which is the seventh trumpet, is obviously uh, most significant because not only it heralds the uh, the rapture of the church, the catching of the church to heaven, the removal of the church, but also it introduces the seven vials of God's wrath. And so, yes, it's a terrible woe. In fact, interestingly, you'll see yet another angel coming after the first two woes and warning yet again. You've heard this uh, woe, you, you thought this was bad for the woe that is yet to come, and we'll study that as we get to. But certainly these are the three woes, and it is significant that this further warning is given from heaven. Again, God's mercy is reaching out to fallen mankind and warning them. I think that the mercy and love of God is just beyond explanation. It's beyond comprehension. And, uh, and that's what's so beautiful, that right to the very, very last, God calls people. God calls to the souls of men and women to repent. And in spite of having to bring judgment upon the earth, which I'm sure is not God's preference, but God's essential justice, it's necessary, that nevertheless, it is His will yet that none should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And sadly, not so many will. Stand with me tonight. We've covered the first four of the seven trumpets that are to come. And what will take place, uh, to give you a quick Uh, preview is that we'll study the next two trumpets and then there will be uh, yet another parenthetical section or portion in the scriptures between the sixth and the seventh trumpet as we go on studying uh, there will be a lot of information that will come our way about uh, the antichrist system and what's happening on earth while we've seen the events in, in coming from heaven god has everything under control amen so once again Traumatic times, you can agree, but also we serve a God who can keep us and he can protect us and and he will keep his people in spite of the judgments that are coming upon the earth. Our task isn't to worry, but to trust and to know that somehow he has everything under control. Praise the Lord. Glory to God. Sister Françoise, would you close the meeting in prayer for us?